Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for making your way to USC on a Monday uh, peak hour. We always appreciate that. Um, on behalf of the faculty and the staff of the Metrans Transportation Center, I would like to welcome you to our very first Industry Outlook event. My name is Jen Giuliano. For those of you don't, who don't know me, I'm the director of Metrans and a faculty member here in the Price School of Public Policy. I want to begin our evening f uh, by thanking our Metrans associates, uh, the sponsors for tonight's event. Uh, for those of you, again, who don't know much about our center, uh, the Metrans Associates provides core support for our center through annual membership contributions. Those who are familiar with Metrans know that we continuously reinvent ourselves. Tonight's Industry Outlook is our newest innovation. The Industry Outlook series is intended to bring new information and new perspectives on topics of interest to the business community, and in particular to the greater international trade industry. I'm sure you know the numbers better than me. Um, here in Southern California, international trade is valued at roughly $400 billion annually and accounts for about 600,000 jobs. You all know again better than me that there are many ways to count and you may consider this number, 600,000, either too high or too low. And maybe we'll debate that another day. The, but the economy is changing. The international trade industry in Southern California has yet to reach its pre-Great Recession peak, and port trade has lost market share. Major drivers of the global economy are shifting from increasing wages in China to the emerging sharing economy here in the United States. What should we be thinking about as we seek to grow the regional economy? What trends should be we be watching? Tonight, we're going to hear Dan Gardner's perspective on the challenges facing the U.S. economy and how they relate to the last several decades of U.S. trade policy. Before I introduce Dan, I have some announcements. Uh, the first announcement is that you should mark your calendar for the next town hall meeting that will take place on Wednesday, October 15th, 2014 at 6 p.m. in the Carpenter Performing Arts Center on the Cal State Long Beach campus. The theme this year is global trends and local responses and will build on tonight's presentation. All of you who have RSVP'd for this event will receive more information by email. Second announcement, you will receive a brief survey via email after the event. Please help us improve this new event by completing the survey. Announcement three, um, an event like this happens only through the hard work of many people. I'd like to recognize the following people who may or may not be in the room because they've been running around working. Uh, Tom O'Brien, Vicki Valentine, Alex Traver, Catherine Showalter, Ariel Sharesh, Anjali Logan, and several USC and Cal State students. For those of you who have been helping us who are in the room, please stand, wave, recognize, and we can give you a round of applause. Okay, thank you very much. Now for the program. Our speaker this evening is Dan Gardner, founder and president of Trade Facil <laughs> Facilitators, Inc., a Los Angeles-based supply chain consulting and executive search firm. Uh, we have distributed his bio, and so I'm just going to cover a few of the highlights. The first one is that Dan has over 25 years of experience in the 3PL business and has held a number of executive positions. He has an MBA from the University of Miami and has been a licensed customs house broker in the U.S. since 1989. Dan taught for several years at the University of Miami and Florida International University before we discovered him and drafted him for the Global Logistics Program at Cal State Long Beach. Dan is a busy man. In addition to running his own firm, he is an author and a journalist. He's written for the Journal of Commerce and other trade publications, and he's published four books on various aspects of international trade. With many years of experience in the business, Dan has developed his own perspective on the role of international trade and trade policy on the economy. His perspective is interesting and thought-provoking, and we are delighted to have him here tonight to include us in this conversation. 
Uh, we're going to have Dan speak, and then uh, we will have some Q&A at the end. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dan to the podium. I'd like to add my welcome to this, the, the first ever presentation of, of Making Hay, the future of U.S. competitiveness in the age of globalization. Also want to be sure and thank you for, for coming here today. I know it's not easy on a Monday late in the afternoon dealing with traffic and such, so the fact that you're here is greatly appreciated. I'd be remiss in my responsibilities as well if I didn't thank Drs. Giuliano and Tom O'Brien from Cal State, uh, who, who were the the gatekeepers of, of this presentation. I, I had to convince them that this was a worthy topic to, to discuss and they were kind enough to, to turn the reins over to me for just one brief moment. It's hard to believe that it was just a couple months ago that we were in this very room, uh, Genevieve, Tom, and myself talking about making hay and the possibility of making this presentation. And as I said, it, it's, uh, this is a bit of a departure from Metrans in, in terms of their public outreach it deals mostly with town halls and panels and such so it was really quite exciting and, and quite flattering to have the opportunity to come up here and meet I, I can remember telling my friends uh, thinking that I was either Matt Damon or Ben Affleck when they wrote Goodwill Hunting that I had a pitch meeting with, with the, the studios up in up in Hollywood and I was going up to pitch pitch my idea and of course it's the topic is very consistent with what Metrans does and such so I don't think it was so much that but in retrospect, and then talking this evening with Jen and Tom, I, I think it was I don't know, maybe more so Jen than Tom, but wanted to make sure that I wasn't a kook and I was going to get up here and kind of <laughs> rant and rave and turn into Glenn Beck. So I'm going to channel, <laughs> channel, channel my inner kook to, in a positive direction. This is a very upbeat presentation. It's full of optimism. And something that I think is very important to all of us, whether you work in international trade or not. So what we're going to talk about is making hay. And we all know how the rest of that saying goes. You have to make hay while the sun is shining. And the entire narrative of the conversation is, is about the ability to compete. And that is countries on the global stage, industries within countries, the companies that work in those industries, and most important, and especially for the young people here tonight, how people can develop the skills that they need to be able to compete on the global stage. The short version of how Making Hay came about I just gave to you, the, the longer version is, is just that. It, it's a little bit longer. Uh, during the course of my career, uh, I'm originally from Massachusetts. You may detect a slight New England accent here, but I've had the good fortune of working in the logistics trade starting back in the, in the port of Boston many, many, many years ago. And, and the great thing about third-party logistics or freight forwarding as we used to call it, is that you get a lot of exposure to different industries, literally in the morning providing air freight services to medical diagnostic companies or ocean freight services to shoe importers from Vietnam. And if you spend enough time listening to what people do and being in factories in China and Singapore and Eastern Europe and Brazil and Mexico, as I have, you can start to form a bit of a, an opinion about how things go. So, what you're going to see tonight is a, is a little bit of a history lesson. It's a little bit of journalistic investigation. And it's a fair amount of my own opinions and experiences across the decades. It's 100% it's All-American. And as I said, something I think is very important to each of us. So let's see how things are going to roll this evening. <clears throat> in terms of a framework and narrative, again, the theme here is competitiveness, the ability to compete in the age of globalization. But one of the first themes is the idea of convergence. And we're going to talk about policies, events, and factors that led to the globalization of trade. And when we talk about globalization in general terms, what we really mean is the, move, the freer, not free, but freer movement of goods, services, information, finances, and people across international borders. And since World War II, those barriers to trade have come down. That's what we mean by globalization. That's what we mean by the liberalization of trade. Those are synonymous terms that we're going to use. Convergence is really quite important. As you see when we do our little timeline of events, that it was the coming together of certain planned and unplanned activities that really brought globalization about. So convergence is a big, a big theme. Second point, a tale of two economies. The emergence of global trade in the post-World War II world and what was going on in the United States from 1945 to the present. If anyone thinks that globalization started within the last 10 years 
or even 20 years ago uh, with the signing of NAFTA, that, that's probably uh, not a long enough time period. It actually started right after World War II, and we'll show you how in just a little bit. Next up, invention, innovation, and U.S. competitiveness. Uh, the easy part of this presentation, uh, believe it or not, is the, the hour and 15 minutes that we, the speak, uh, that we speak. The hard part is the research that, that goes into preparing for this type of presentation. But what was really fun was this section here. And I put about, not in this section here, but in its totality, probably about 50 hours into preparing and researching and studying and rehearsing for this presentation. The most fun and the most amazing component of the entire exercise was this invention, innovation, and what made the United States competitive, not only competitive, but dominant through a period of time from the end of World War II. You're going to see some very, very interesting events there, something we should all be proud of. And then, some original thought here, the, uh, the capitalist paradox, which I'll explain to you later, but I think you'll find pretty interesting. And also a concept that is not original, it's called the tragedy of the commons. This is where we really come to a crossroads in our presentation and say, okay, we really dominated things post-World War II, started to see a lot more competition moving into the 70s, certainly 80s, 90s. What do we do now? In this world, actually, that we created, trade liberalization was driven by the United States unequivocally. So much of what we're going to talk about tonight is this is the world we created, this is where we are. Now, how do we respond in a positive fashion to that world that we created? And how we're going to do that is making hay. You, you can't go on and rant for an hour and then not have some positive suggestions to make about what the United States can do as a country to become more competitive in this age of globalization. So we're not going to get too heavy, on, uh, for now at least. We're going to start with a, a little bit of music. And the purpose is really to, to humanize the story because this is very much, a, as I said, a bit of a, a history lesson. And we want to, to humanize our narrative, what's referred to as the formative years of the American century. At the end of World War II, a gentleman who wrote for Time Magazine and Life Magazine published an article in Life. His name was Henry Lucci. And that's where he coined the term the American century. But it wasn't a straight up 1900 to 2,100 years. It was 1945, end of World War II, moving forward. So if we believe that timeline, we have about 30 years to go before someone catches up to us and, and surpasses us. I don't necessarily believe that, but that's where the term the American century came from. The song was not randomly selected. It's by Jackson Brown. For some of you younger people that, that have 5,000 songs in your, in your smartphone, th this is a guy you want to be listening to. And the reason why this song was chosen is because it definitely humanizes the story. Listen closely to the words. It's about competing in the American scene. It was also chosen because it came out in 1976, which as you'll see was a pivotal year in the development of globalization of trade. And then finally, it serves as a metaphor that we'll explain later on. So there's a little slideshow, and the first slides are going to demonstrate the development of industries that really and truly drew, ec drove economic growth in the post-World War II world. The computer age, the wireless age, biotech, internet, etc. But to humanize the story, we have slides that are demonstrative of what was going on in society while all of this globalization was going on. We were living our lives in either not aware or not paying attention to what was happening. So that's the, the sequence of the slides. If you see faces that you don't recognize, I'm going to explain who they are later on. We might even have a little quiz for those of you who are <laughs> students here. So let's, let's hit it. i 
been aware of the time going by They say in the end it's the wink of an eye When the morning light comes streaming in You'll get up and do it again Amen Caught between the longing for love and the struggle Church bells ring and the junk man pounds his fender. Well, the veterans dream of the fight, fast asleep at the traffic light. And the children solemnly wait for the ice cream vendor. Out into the cool of the evening, stroll. Tender. He knows that all his hopes and dreams begin and end there. All right. Did everybody, who, who could identify every person in that, <laughs> in those, I couldn't either. And if I can remember them all tonight, there are a couple that, that cost me a little bit to, to, to think of. But again, the point was to, to humanize the story put forth some of these industries that really and truly drove economic growth and point out the fact that people's lives go on regardless of what's going on, perhaps definitely outside the country in terms of our discussion here. So the time frame is from 1945 to the present and the point we're going to talk about right now is we have to put forth an hypothesis. We're going to make some statements here. We have to be able to support those statements and believe and I, and I think the facts will will speak for themselves. But again, the story here is about competitiveness. Countries, industries, companies, and individuals at the end of the day. So the road to globalization, and we already provided a definition of what globalization is, but the hypothesis is really quite simple. The, the United States was the driver of the liberalization of trade from the end of the World War II forward. We, have, we had some help, uh, particularly in Europe, but we really dro drove these trade liberalization programs, making it easier for other countries to do business primarily with the United States, their exports coming to the United States. All well intentioned, I think in the context of the decisions, they were the correct ones, but the question becomes, and this is where the hypothesis comes forward, what was business, academia, and government doing in the United States to prepare the American worker for the world that we ultimately created? And part of the answer, a big part of the answer is, pursuant to, to my belief is not much. Now that's not to say that we weren't unbelievably successful, it's just a question of we got to a certain point now and we have to rethink the ball game. So that's really, I won't read this verbatim, but of course making hay is about making hay while the sun is shining, to be able to compete while the sun is shining. And in 2014, the trade forces that we put in place will continue to move forward, it will have its ups and downs, but show no sign of abating. So that's our hypothesis. So very quick review on the framework and narrative. Convergence, a tale of two economies. Very important section here, invention, innovation, and U.S. competitiveness. That paradox, the tragedy of the commons, and then what's a country to do. So this is our first timeline, and you'll notice that it runs from 1945 to 1995. And anybody remotely familiar with U.S. history knows that World War II ended in 1945, correct? So we're over here. And right out of the gate, we started in response to the Cold War, which really kicked off in 1947, with the reconstruction of Japan <coughs> and what was called the Marshall Plan in Europe, which was the reconstruction of Europe, but predominantly Germany. And a lot of this had to do with the, the response to the Cold War, to, to bring countries into the democratic fold, into the capitalistic fold, so our allies would remain in place over the years. We'll talk some more about Japan and how things turned out for them in Germany in just a little bit. Something you might not be aware of in 1948, uh, in San Francisco, actually, after, after the war, three years after the war, <coughs> the United States and its allies got together up in Northern California and came up with four ideas three of which stuck, one of which didn't. The first one was the founding of the United Nations. The UN Charter was signed in San Francisco. I don't know if you, if you knew that. The World Bank 
and the International Monetary Fund also came into play around here. The fourth organization, little known, got lost in history, was called the International Trade Organization. And its goal was to promote trade liberalization, as we defined just a moment ago, so that when countries came together and did business together and made friends with one another, that the likelihood of war would be decreased. It was called the, General, it was called the International Trade Organization. For one reason or another, we won't go into the details, the ITO didn't make it, wasn't ratified. Uh, mainly by the United States. What did remain was this general agreement on tariffs and trade, which, although not as official as the ITO, its idea was that, that member countries would start to reduce those high import taxes, cumbersome customs clearance procedures, import license requirements, to make it easier for countries and companies to do business together. That's the GATT. The GATT became the WTO, the World Trade Organization, in 1995. More on that in just a moment. <coughs> In terms of Southern California and all of the jobs that, that Genevieve mentioned, uh, and certainly maybe not all, but a high percentage of them would not have been possible without the advent of containerized shipping. We take for granted when we're sitting in traffic on the 110 and the 710 that containerized cargo has been around forever. Uh, it has not. It was an American innovation and changed the world literally and, and made international trade possible. It was conceived by a gentleman American named Malcolm McLean in the Carolinas. He owned a trucking company. And he was frustrated with the idea of bulk cargo, goods that were loaded and unloaded off of ships loose, and what could, you, what could be done to make it easier. Long story short, he came up with the idea for the ocean container. That was in 1957. And it just revolutionized trade. The first converted ship that sailed from Newark to Houston had 57 containers on it. The largest steamship lines today that dock in LA and Long Beach can carry 18,000 20-foot containers. So think about the amount of time, the short amount of time that has gone by and how that has impacted every facet of what has become to be known as the consumption society. That's containerized shipping. Richard Nixon, best known for his escapades in Watergate, unfortunately really established detente with the, with the Chinese. This is Mao Zedong. In 1948, when communist China came into being, this is the gentleman that was behind that. We unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, backed someone named Chiang Kai-shek. And there was no communication with China at all up until President Nixon visits China in 1972. Kind of opened the door, established a dialogue. So whereas President Nixon is remembered for other things, this was a very, very important moment. In terms of importing into the United States and becoming a consumption society and establishing what seems to be a permanent trade deficit with the rest of the world, the most important three letters and probably most unknown are right here. Stands for G, st well it doesn't stand for GSP, it stands for the Generalized System of Preferences. And that is a program established specifically by the US Congress and endorsed by the President, whereby selected countries around the world were offered what's called a preferential duty program, meaning they could export their goods from, let's start out with the four tigers, because that's who they became, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, that they could export their goods and develop their export markets to the United States at a reduced duty rate. Those countries became the Asian tigers. GSP is not the only preferential duty program that the United States offers. We're going to show some more. But the Trade Act of 1974 that went into play in 1976 was a direct result of the Cold War, if you can believe that. What year did the United States withdraw from Vietnam? 1973. What year did Saigon fall to the North Vietnamese? 1975. It's no coincidence that countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, who were all under the specter and threat of communism, were brought into the fold through GSP. That is also unequivocal. We'll talk more about the Asian Tigers in just a bit. Here's a big one that also drove trade, not only in, around the world, but for us here in Southern California, hugely important. And coming together with containerized shipping, very, very important. Prior to 78, air travel was regulated all the prices were the same. If you flew from LA to Atlanta, all the airlines charged the same amount. Trucking, rail, it was all regulated by the government. In 1978, 
started under Jerry Ford, was continued under Jimmy Carter, and was actually pushed through by a, a native son of Massachusetts by the name of Teddy Kennedy, was behind the deregulation of transportation, that for us here in Southern California created freight forwarding, customs brokerage, truck brokerage, LTL services, the whole gamut of support activities around the core air, ocean freight, rail, and truck business was born right here. So you bring all of these together and we're setting the stage for globalization big time. Who knows who this little fellow is here? Probably the most important figure in, in globalization as it relates to on the ground trade activities. That's Deng Xiaoping. And he replaced Mao Zedong when he passed away. He's standing on the balcony in 1980 of the only hotel that stood in Shenzhen, China, which became the epicenter of the, the, the Chinese miracle that became the factory to the world. These reforms were brought about by a huge drought in China and the Chinese government, that one party system, realized that they had to change their ways, that they had to promote trade. And the only way to do that was to promote exports, the ability to own com companies, to engage in what most people would call capitalism, but what Deng Xiaoping called socialism with Chinese characteristics. I like that. <laughs> And it was the only hotel. Shenzhen today is just massive. Uh, China, obviously, it's the, it's the world's factory, as I said. But it all started in South China, Shenzhen, about in car right now, maybe two, three hours from, from Hong Kong. So that's where that miracle started. Say what you want about the Chinese, the one-party system, the, the one-child story, um, human rights, all true. But one thing that they had that perhaps we should have been thinking about, they had a strategy from the get-go that was renewed every five years and look where they are today. Started in 1980, that's 34 years. Unbelievable. First, FTA, that's a free trade agreement. Unlike a preferential duty program, a free trade agreement offers reciprocal access to your partner's market. The first, some people think NAFTA was our first, it wasn't. It was with Israel, 19. 85. So there's a difference here between a preferential duty program and an FTA. More on that in just a minute. Europe comes together in 1993. That drove globalization quite a bit. And here we are at the WTO in 1995. So convergence as a theme, you can start to see where this story comes together. <coughs> so let's connect the dots. And, and we're not here to pass judgment on anybody. I think in, in the context of what was going on, these decisions were, were well-intentioned and even well thought out. But the law of unintended consequences has a tendency to, to rear its head, maybe not immediately, but 20, 30 years down the road, and then you deal with the consequences then. So let's have a look here. Cold War starts in 1947. We talked about the Marshall Plan and Japan Reconstruction. We already mentioned this. The U.S. withdraws from Vietnam in 73. Saigon goes in 1975, and here comes the generalized system of preferences. I do not think that that is a coincidence at all. Every one of those four Asian tigers was under the threat of communist invasion. One of the ways to bring them into the fold, protect them, is to offer preferential duty programs into the United States. <coughs> threat of communism in the Americans and the U.S. invasion of Grenada. Remember that? in 19, oh I skipped one, ongoing troubles in the Middle East and bombings of the U.S. Marine Barracks in 1983. I remember this specifically. I was a senior in college. I was a prodigy. I was 10 years old when I was a <laughs> senior in college. So you can, you can do the math on that. And I was the, the resident assistant on my floor in the, in the dormitory. That's, that's another story. We won't get into that either. But there was a guy who lived on my floor, and his twin brother was in the Marine Corps, and he was in Lebanon when this happened. And I remember him calling home and trying to find out what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. I remember that specifically. Right after that, America's first free trade agreement signed with Israel in 1985. It's not a coincidence. You can do the research. I saved you the trouble. This is not a coincidence at all. Threat of communism in the Americas and the U.S. invasion of Grenada in 83. Implementation of another preferential duty program called the Caribbean Basin Initiative. When we start going beyond 1986, that's when I started to get into this business and can move away from a history lesson to sharing firsthand experiences. I saw this in Latin America in the early 90s, and it's interesting to point out that it was as it related to textiles, wearing apparel, and footwear when the U.S. Congress decided that the Asian Tiger should no longer have those preferential programs for textiles and footwear, 
this came on board and we were visiting factories in Jamaica, Haiti, Dominican Republic and all throughout Central America in about 1993 and all of the, the companies who were in those countries, Hong Kong, Singapore, who lost their GSP privileges on wearing apparel and footwear, brick by brick they took those factories and moved them here. So I can remember being in factories who the owners were originally from Taiwan and Hong Kong, etc., employing 500 Costa Ricans in those factories. I was there, I saw it. This is how this whole thing works. Continuing on, civil wars in Central America in the 80s, uh, specifically El Salvador and Nicaragua. Along comes yet another preferential duty program called the Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery Act that became the Central America Free Trade Agreement. Again, just some further support for our theory. Drug-related instability in Latin America, the 80s and 90s. Along comes the Andean Trade Preference Act. Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela. Countries that were having troubles for these reasons brought into the fold access to the U.S. market for their exports into the U.S. during that time period. And then ethnic violence and political instability in Africa. And we came up with the African Growth and Opportunity Act in the year 2000. So a clear pattern, pattern forming here. So back in the day, the prevailing wisdom, and this is interesting, and I put the quote up first so you can kind of guess when this came out. But this is what people were thinking, the pundits, the experts were thinking about preferential duty programs. You tell me if it smacks of hubris and, and pride. It's right out of the gate. We are a great nation, so I think we know where this is going. It ill behooves us to require reciprocal benefits, i.e. a free trade agreement, from Luxembourg, probably not the best example to use, before we reduce a tariff on Luxembourg products or throw thousands of Chinese refugees suddenly out of work by imposing import quotas on textiles from Hong Kong. Let us live up to our destiny and set the pace, not be reluctant followers. Who's that guy? Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, exactly. From the Chicago School of Economics, big time free trade proponent. Uh, had a lot of really, really smart things to say. I've read most of his work and an admirer. He had a lot of good things to say. This wasn't one of them. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. It came from a book called Capitalism and Freedom, written the year I was born, 1962. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 76, the same year GSP went into play. Do you think he had the ear of the president at the time? He didn't tell me himself, but my guess is, whoops, that he did. So, beware the pundits, beware the experts. So, we took that advice from, from Milton. These are other preferential duty pr programs currently in place. And if you're interested in reading this up, or reading up on this, the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States is where you'll find it. And anybody who works in imports in the U.S., and myself as a licensed customs broker, this is the Bible because it tells us what products can come into the country and what duty rates they pay, what tariffs they pay, what taxes they pay on those imports coming into the country. So here, let's do a little math here. GSP, that's 106 countries. I counted them, so you don't have to. <laughs> the, automotive, the Automotive Products Trade Act, this is industry specific, uh, mostly to do with Canada, pre-NAFTA, but that's in there. Civil Aircraft gets some special treatment. 40 countries in Africa on that Oppor Growth and Opportunity Act. CBER, Caribbean Basin Economic Recovery, 18. Uh, agreement on Trade and Pharmaceuticals, they get their own special deal. Um, as Jen mentioned, I've been a licensed customs broker since 1989. I still don't know what this is. The Uruguay Round Concessions on Intermediate Chemicals for Dyes. I want to meet the person who wrote that. <laughs> and then products of the freely associated states. This is Palau and Micronesia and some of our other vital <laughs> allies. And the, sorry, U.S. Caribbean Trade Partnership Act, seven countries. That's 174 countries that have preferential duty treatment for goods coming into the U.S., whereby we don't have any with them. Now, it's the right thing to do. Pro you could make that argument. We're not here to pass judgment or call into question. We're here to share the facts. And these are indeed the facts of the case. 174 countries. Bearing in mind that there are upwards of 7 billion people on this planet, we are a country of some 300 odd million. We're a little outnumbered here, so we need to kind of rally and come together. This is what it looks like in the real world. And the, the people or entity that governs 
What's called the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States is the U.S. International Trade Commission. This is obviously 2014. This was selected somewhat randomly, but you go through that, goodness, couple thousand page document and it's free online. It's not exactly free, you pay for it with your tax dollars, but you can go and find this. And this is how it looks. For, so people who are importing goods into the country, when they determine what it is, where it came from, and what's the customs duty, this is what they use to do that. This has been the Bible for people like me for forever and ever. So this is from chapter 85 that deals with electrical machinery and equipment, blah, blah, blah. And we're talking about electric motors coming in. This is the important part over here. So the general column is for countries that we're, what we have normal trade relations with. It used to be called most favored nation status, but that sounded like we were playing favorites, so we changed it to normal trade relations. England, France, our allies that we've been hanging with for some time. Here's the special column. Every single one of those programs has a letter associated with it. A, for example, is GSP. So you can see the difference. You come out of a GSP country, it's free. You come out of just a general normal trade relations at 6%. Column two is the people that just, we don't want to have anything to do with. So 90%, <laughs> yeah, let's uh, bring in some stuff from North Korea at a 90% duty rate. That's probably <laughs> not the good idea. So to use the parlance of the, the younger people today, these are friends, these are friends with benefits, okay? <laughs> I like that one. I was hoping that would go over. I'm, I'm glad you, I practiced that for hours. I'm, I'm glad that went over. Okay, so this is what it looks like. So, oh, fine. We're not questioning, we're not judging here. But, some interesting statistics and facts, and these are obviously, this is Japan, Germany, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, flag. Great source, and for those of you that are students or researching and lo looking for good, solid sources, the CIA World Factbook is a great place to, to find a lot of good information. This is a 2013 estimate. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, starting with the reconstruction of Japan and Germany, let's see how things have panned out. Japan is the world's number four economy. That's 5.1 trillion with 127 million people. This is an estimate. The, the CIA World Factbook believes that India will surpass Japan this year. Maybe it will, maybe it won't but it's still a big time player. Germany, number five economy at 3.3 trillion with 81 million people. They've done well for themselves. And they weren't interested in a handout. These people worked very, very hard. And the thing that they had from the very get-go was a strategy to develop specific industries, automotive, steel, textiles, textile machinery, and an export-oriented fashion to generate hard currency. They didn't get anything for free. They had access to the U.S. market, but these people work very, very hard. We can learn a lot from these countries. Let's look at the Tigers that we talked about. The first beneficiaries of GSP. Hong Kong, it's an island. 381 billion in GDP, that's 36 in the world. $52,700 in per capita gross domestic product. That makes them number 14 in the world with a 7.1 million population. Not bad. 102 on the list of top populations. Singapore, amazing story of transformation over the years. 339 billion, <coughs> excuse me, GDP, number 41 in the world. Their per capita GDP is higher than ours. Of course, they have a smaller population, but they're number seven in the world in per capita GDP and five and a half million people. This is an island 24 miles around. They've done pretty well for themselves. South Korea, who just in the last year or two, after years and years and years of GSP, we got a free trade agreement with. We now have access to their market. 1.6 trillion GDP, that puts them at number 13. 33,000 and change on the per capita GDP, 50 million population, done well. Same for Taiwan, close to a trillion, 926 billion, makes them 21 on GDP, about 40,000 and per capita GDP and a population of 23 million people. Every single one of these countries established a strategy, they educated their people, and they went to work. And they took advantage of what was afforded them along the road towards global globalization. So you can't hold anything. In fact, we, we should be benchmarking these countries. Can't hold anything against them. Here we are at 16.7 trillion. Our per capita GDP is 52,008, and we're at 318 million 
people. So just some fun facts. You don't believe me? Believe the facts. <clears throat> so a few comments on free trade. And this is where things start to go off the rail, Jen. I'm just telling you now. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Hopefully, we can put this to rest because there are lots of different opinions and we shouldn't have free trade agreements. Here's the, the, the layman's story on free trade agreements. The horse, not even the horse, the horses, all 174 of them, got out of the barn a long time ago. All we're looking for is reciprocal access to these markets. That, that's probably the best argument I can succinctly offer to be a proponent of a free trade agreement. We gave the shop away 40 years ago. So what do we, what do we what's the beef, I guess? to use a term from the 1980s as well. So, through our preferential duty programs, the U.S. systematically opened its borders to developing countries with no reciprocal benefits. Conversely, the intent of any FTA, free trade agreement, is to encourage two-way trade through the removal, as we said, of tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. There's nothing free about free trade. You have to be able to compete, which takes us almost full circle, halfway, to the point that we've been bringing up. There's nothing free. You have to compete with these countries. And to benefit from its FTAs, the U.S. needs sophisticated products that don't compete on price alone. We cannot compete on price alone. Whether it's in the manufacturing sector or in the services sector, we have to find other ways to add value to encourage countries to do business with U.S. companies. So everybody has an opinion. Hopefully this, this has influenced yours because the horses are out of the barn, big time. Interesting to note, these are the countries that we have free trade agreements with today. Longtime allies and some new players. Australia, they've been an ad, they fought with us in World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam. I'd say they earned their free trade agreement. Bahrain, Canada, part of NAFTA, Chile, thriving economy in Latin America, a great benchmark country to have a look at. Colombia. That was not, not only on GSP, but they were also on the, the Andean Trade Act. We now have a free trade agreement with Colombia. 50 million people person market there that we now have access to export our goods to them. These here are all part of that CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. Here's our fourth, first. Jordan we have a FTA with. Korea we mentioned. Mexico. 20 years this year. NAFTA. Morocco, Nicaragua, Oman, Panama, Peru, and Singapore. We'll talk some more about this later, but my first question is, these are important partners. You don't want to diminish the significance of their involvement, but where are the big guns? Where are the Brazils that have been on GSP since day one? Where are some, where, where's the European Union? Where's China, for that matter? We have a $30 billion a month, a month trade deficit with China. So more on that later, but think about who's on this list and perhaps who should be on this list. <clears throat> These are the guys that we saw earlier, albeit in that slideshow. So I wanted to take an opportunity and jog our memories a bit. Who's this guy? That's Thomas Watson Sr., founder of what became the modern day IBM, which, which drove economic growth in the computer sector from day one coming out of World War II. This is Robert Noyce. Co-founder of Fairchild Semiconductor, co-founder of Intel, developer of the integrated circuit, the microprocessor. This gentleman had a big, huge impact on job creation in the U.S. and globalization. Hewlett Packard. Who's that guy? It's not Michael Douglas from Wall Street. Remember him on the beach with the big, huge phone? That's not him. His name is Martin Cooper, working for Motorola, based on funding that was in part provided by the United States government, developed the first cell phone, the wireless age. I think we know who these guys are, right? Do we even have to comment on the hairdos? I, I don't think so. <laughs> but in terms of growth, uh, if you're a, a student of business history in the United States as, as I am, the, the two biggest comebacks for com countries, companies that were right there in the tank, ready to go, was IBM in the 1990s and Apple. Just an amazing unbelievable comeback story based on what? Innovation and invention and of course job creation that went along with it. Who are these guys? This guy here owns the Seattle Seahawks. They won the Super Bowl last year which was devastating to a Boston native like myself. I don't know how that happened. His name is Paul Allen. He's the co-founder of Microsoft. Who's that guy? Come on. Michael Dell. 
started Dell Computer in his dorm room at UT Austin. <coughs> Created thousands and thousands of jobs. How about these guys? This is a little bit more obscure. This is from, and I included this because it's from the biotech sector. When venture capital in Northern California came together with biotech to form one of the most important companies in the world, Genentech. This gentleman's name was Swanson, has since deceased, and his name was Boyer. He was the money man, he was the science man. And I think we know what biotech has done in terms of development and innovation and improving lives and creating jobs. These are the guys that really helped to commercialize the internet back in 1995. This is Mark Andreessen. Jim Clark, or what was referred to later on as adult supervision for the, for the startups in, in Northern California. Netscape was the first really commercial web browser. Where did Mr. Andreessen come from? Illinois. Illinois. Working for the United States government to develop Mosaic, which was one of the first web browsers as well. Sponsored by who? The United States government. Thank you very much. How about these guys? We're getting a little more modern now. Help me out. These are the Google guys. Larry Page, Sergey Brin. Who's that? Jeff Bezos from Amazon. That whole business model, web-based business model that's created so many jobs. This guy has created a lot of jobs right here in Southern California, Torrance and other places. That's Elon Musk. Tesla and SpaceX. The commercialization of space travel has been pioneered by this young man from South Africa, came to the United States via Canada. And I reluctantly included <laughs> this guy because I needed a fifth block for my pyramid. See how it goes into a, a pyramid here? We're, we're gonna get on him a little bit later. <clears throat> So this is to say, not to say that the, the entire economic growth was established by these gentlemen, but the founding industries that drove and facilitated the building of entire economies, you can definitely say that. The thousands, if the hundreds of thousands of anonymous and faceless people who started machine shops to support these businesses, restaurants to feed the people that work there, dry cleaners, parts plants, et cetera. The, the butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers that supported this, this growth. This is what drove growth in the United States. These are the people, and there are many, many others, but it's only one screen <coughs> that drove that growth. So this is what was going on in the economy. Capitalist society, and this is super interesting, at, at least to, to me. <coughs> this whole idea of creative destruction. Re read this very quickly. The opening up of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop, small businesses, to the large corporations illustrates the same process of industrial mutation that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old, incessantly creating the new. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism. So think about what the, the automobile did to the horse and buggy. That's creative destruction. Think about what the light bulb did to kerosene lamps. That's creative destruction. Some jobs are going to get lost. New jobs are going to get created. That's an essential fact of, of capitalism. This is a little obscure. Any guesses on who said this? Schumpeter. Joseph Schumpeter. Good call. That's him. When did he write that? <clears throat> In a book called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. 1942. This was actually in response to the, the Keynesian wave that came during the Depression and such. We won't bore you with the details of that, but it was a, a reactionary piece that really makes a lot of sense. So if you think about creative destruction in the industries and the founders of those industries that we just illustrated, you can see where the economic growth really comes from. Some examples of creative destruction. What did the ATM do to bank teller jobs? They diminished, correct? How about, and some of you might not even know what this is, that's film. <laughs> <laughs> that's film. I, I can remember when you go on vacation 15, 20 years ago, and you'd take pictures with a film camera, then you'd have to bring the little roll to CVS and come back in a week and get your pictures, and then you'd be all excited to go back and get them. The digital camera replaced that. You know who discovered the technology that led to the digital camera? Kodak but they were so tied up in the cash cow of film. How do I know this? They were a client of mine years ago on the export side out of Rochester, New York. I, New York. I know this for a fact. They passed up, they kept cashing in, kept cashing in, and the Japanese developed, got their hands on that technology, 
end of story. Kodak is history for all intents and purposes. So that's a bad case of creative destruction. Here's the computer. From big iron, as it was called, to the desktops of the 1980s, to the laptop, to the tablet. Now, if we were to go backwards 3,000 years in time, it would probably be illustrative to point out that we started out with tablets. They were wet clay tablets, <laughs> right? Drawing little symbols with a stylus and what have you. We've come full circle. Oh, whoops. We've come, <laughs> we've come full circle over here. How about the fax machine? I can remember, clear as day, in the 1980s, working in the international trade business in Boston, the day we got our first fax. You would have thought someone brought a firstborn home into the office. It was a fax machine. And only one guy, his name was Adi. This was Boston, so it wasn't Art. It was Adi. He was the only one who had the technology to run, I'm serious, to run the fax machine. I'm totally serious. Someone asked me for my fax number the other day on the phone, and I, I said to them, are you crazy? A fax? I, wh what are you even talking about? It's been replaced by email. Think about all the companies that were involved in manufacturing faxes. You know who developed the technology for the fax machine? Xerox. More on that in just a bit. Here's why. You know who that guy is? He was so younger. Bruce Springsteen, the boss. And if you... Follow my recommendation on Jackson Brown. You have, to, you have to get the early Bruce before he went commercial. Genius. A, a, a real, real storyteller. This was his second album. Well, second big time album, Darkness on the Edge of Town. Think about the creative destruction there. Used to have to buy an album, put it on the record player, and put the needle on it. I remember that. Then came the 8-track. Okay? <laughs> then came cassettes. Then came CDs. And then came this little guy here. Uh, what is it, the shuffle? I can remember this thing came out some years ago. There was $150 retail. Within four months, I went to a conference for a company that a multinational I was working for. They had gotten so cheap, and this company was cheap, so believe me. They were giving them away to everybody that came to the conference. I still have it. So you can see how the price points start to diminish and how quickly this idea of creative destruction, it just accelerates faster and faster and faster. Here's a big one. Nokia was the big gun. They were a client of ours back in the early 2000s. They had six plants around the world that could crank out two million handsets a month. They missed the boat on the smartphone. They got bought by Microsoft. Creative destruction. So these are just examples. <coughs> this is a fascinating slide, and we won't spend too, too, too much time on it. But it's just amazing. The convergence in the U.S. economy from 45 to 2010, we've, ex we've extended our timeline. So very quickly, we come out of World War II, the world is decimated. We have all the money, we have all the production capacity, we're the only belligerent in the war whose home country wasn't pretty much demoed. <clears throat> 1946, the first computer was called the ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. Can't believe I remembered that. In 1946, came out of U the University of Pennsylvania, the Moore School of Electrical Engineering. Philadelphia could have been the Silicon Valley of the United States, but they decided to pursue their opportunities with the Philly cheesesteak, and <laughs> they kind of went down, they kind of went down that road. But it started in Pennsylvania with the, another computer, the Univac here, started that computer industry. Important in and of itself, who funded this? The United States government for things like ballistic tables, for fighting the Cold War, compiling statistics. The U.S. government was behind all of this. IBM was also a beneficiary of that exercise. The United States government was one of its biggest customers. When Social Security went into play in the 1930s, guess who handled it for him? Albeit with punch card machines and then computers, IBM. So things are off and running here. Let's move forward. 1958, the first Japanese auto, you'll notice it wasn't in a container, came into the United States in 58. That's a Toyota Crown. And the first incursion of, of Japanese autos into the United States was a complete abject failure. Failure. They went back to Japan with their tail between their legs, regrouped, got a new strategy, and look where we are now. Some very, very high-end and high-quality automobiles there. That was in 58. 59, there's Robert Noyce. Developed the integrated circuit. Started Fairchild Semiconductor. Created a whole industry, which later became Intel, and the microprocessor came out in 1971. Walmart. Sam Walton, he was in business long before Walmart came along, but the first Walmart was founded in 1962. So this whole idea of the import society 
starts to come into play. Do you think companies, and we're not singling out anybody here, but whether it's Japanese autos or retailers that they benefited from GSP and some of these other preferential duty programs, of course. We as a society benefited because we had products that were basically moving into the 90s into the 2000s inflation free. But this is where that all started. Now just amazing development and growth. And this is a short list. I had to shorten this list. But look at the companies and industries that were started in this time period. Intel, 68. Xerox Park, that's the Palo Alto Research Center. Laser printer, fax machine, prototype of a desktop computer. The mouse, Apple did not invent the mouse. It was invented here. Steve Jobs borrowed it from Xerox. The Intel Microprocessor 71. Now you can start to see why 76 was such an important year, that time frame, plus or minus four years, and why we chose, partly why we chose that, that song. It's so indicative. Prime Computer. These were huge players in the state of Massachusetts, non-existent today. These guys were big. ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Administration, the forerunner to what? The Internet. The Internet. Funded by who? The United States Government Department of Defense. Debuted in 72. Email. Email was born in the great state of Massachusetts at a company called Bolt, Baranac, and Newman in Cambridge, about two miles from Harvard University. Ethernet, that's networking equipment, 73, led to the founding of 3Com. Microsoft, 75, Apple, 76. Biotech, 76, those two gents we saw. Big time surge in growth and innovation and job creation. What begins to happen to these industries when that process of creative destruction, a big element thereof, is start to be outsourced overseas and component parts are started to be imported from overseas? Has a very real impact on creative destruction. More on that in a second. The IBM PC in 81, Sun Micro in 82, Compaq, remember them? They were acquired by HP. 1982, the first Japanese auto plant in the United States in Ohio, 1982. They came away pretty quickly, no? Not too many people were paying attention to that. Neither was I because I was a sophomore in undergrad and I was busy doing other things. TCPIP, that's the protocol for the internet. Transmission control protocol, internet protocol, 83. The Mac in 84. Remember the Super Bowl commercial in 1984 of the introduction of the Mac? This was huge. Super Bowl commercials today are lousy. This one was really quite good. Cisco in 84, Dell in 84, the first HP laser jet. My goodness, look and see how much innovation and in invention drove economic growth in this country. It was all in here. And the butchers and the bakers and the candlestick makers that did all the other things that created this vast economic cluster in Northern California, up in the Chicago area, New York, New Jersey for pharmaceuticals, oil and gas in the, in the Texas, Oklahoma area. This is what drove growth. This is what drove job creation. The cell phone was invented in 73. It first became commercialized, look at it, in 1983, the wireless revolution. And all of those cell phones and all of the raw materials that went into them were sourced and built in the United States. I know this for a fact because Motorola was a client of ours. And how they began, justifiably, we're not here to single anybody out, to start outsourcing and manufacturing overseas. It disrupts the dynamic of creative disruption. Netscape, we talked about the software age, when every single aspect of our life was a software program was written for it. Think about what you did today. You went into a parking garage. Was there software to do that? Absolutely. 20 years ago, there wasn't. Go to the dry cleaners, which I did on Saturday. The whole, just give them your phone number. They can tell you your whole life story. Blood type, social security number, favorite color. It's a little creepy, but the software age dro drew, drove job creation quite a bit. And then, of course, the dot-com bubble. We don't need to go into that. We've all heard enough about this, but this is where globalization really took hold in the United States because it's nice to have all these programs and an attitude towards free trade, but if you don't have creativity, if you don't have industries to drive them, there's really not much to talk about. So, convergence, it all comes together. And this is where the story really starts to get interesting. So we know GSP, we know containerized shipping. The stage was set, look at this triangle here. We had the countries to source from, we had the means to transport the merchandise, 
and deregulation of U.S. transportation in 78. So where I can tell you for certain that when these companies started out, everything they sourced, their raw materials, components, sub-assemblies, et cetera, all in the United States and built in factories in the United States. Starting in the late 1980s when I broke into the freight forwarding business and became a witness and a small participant in this process, it started out where goods were still manufactured here, but raw materials were brought in from overseas. And then the process continued where the entire, the entire manufacturing activity was offshored. So today, for example, Apple makes all of their, their smartphones overseas. And so they should. It's, it's economics. It's capitalism. It's the world that we created. But this is what happened. So when you disrupt this idea of creative destruction, wh where do all the jobs go? What becomes of those jobs? So here are the facts of the case. And I'm not a lawyer, but I like to pretend like I am from time to time. <coughs> Labor-intensive production jobs, offshored years ago, not coming back. Do not believe what you hear about nearshoring and ha what have you as it relates to wearing apparel and footwear. One of the few remaining clusters of wearing apparel activity, and I'm talking actual production or at least cutting and stitching, is here in California in the fashion district. Amazing amount of international commerce going on not two miles from here. But in terms of the rest of the country, you can forget it. Automation and robotics have eroded mid to high level manufacturing jobs. That's a natural consequence of creative destruction. What we should be thinking about as a country is not what happened to these jobs. Who's making this equipment? Who's selling this stuff? Because I can tell you a lot of it is the Japanese and the Germans because they focus on high end engineering. Italy, high end stuff. So it's not about, it is about the manufacturing jobs, but that's kind of a done deal. We need to be thinking about who's making this stuff here. Number four, some of the mid to high level jobs were also offshored. These countries aren't sitting around. Japan, who is the fourth largest economy in the world, at least according to the World Factbook from the CIA, started out exporting textiles and textile machinery. They continued as part of their strategy to become more sophisticated based on the education of their people and the training of their people. They didn't start out that way. So these countries, look at Poland. I went to Poland a year and a half ago, two years ago, bearing in mind that they converted overnight to a capitalist society in right around 1993. The progress that they have made is nothing short of amazing. Unbelievable how they made that quick adjustment and became competitive. Vietnam, South Africa, the list goes on and on. It's not just China. I've been to these places. They can compete big time. <clears throat> and they'll do it for less money. Forgot to add that in there. So that creates a little bit of a problem. Our continued urban development compensated for some of these losses. And it contributed to our becoming that consumption society in housing, commercial real estate, infrastructure, very, very important, and helped out quite a bit. Upper level service jobs stimulated economic growth as well, but a different skill set, i.e. you need a college degree, at least in most cases, to move up into the upper ranks of these industries, banking, financial, insurance, et cetera. New generations, younger people enter the workforce, and now we're coming into the 2000s. Some of the slack, some, was picked up by labor intensive jobs and service industries at lower wages. Now there's, there's dignity in all work, so let's not make a mistake about that, but the fact remains that in the post-financial crisis and, and the figures you hear about unemployment and such uh, are jobs that sometimes people don't want to be in or are overqualified for. So we can't be misguided by, by those figures. Dignity in all work, but not necessarily the type of work where the economic growth that we saw over the last 60 years is going to continue at the pace we saw previously. Advanced service industries have really fueled growth. Medicine, engineering, software, as we talked about, big time jobs there. However, advanced service industries require a much a more developed skill set than traditional manufacturing jobs. When people came back from, from World War II, they could go into manufacturing in an auto plant or a steel plant and have a good job, make an honest living, have a good retirement. Those days are gone forever. <clears throat> These advanced industries, be they service or otherwise, there's a more developed skill set that needs to be in place. And there's a gap between them. Talk to anybody who's in the, um, the, the employment field and they will concur. And several service industries have also been offshored. Let me ask you this. Do, do you think a plastic surgeon working in Miami, Florida, South Florida, is somehow threatened by globalization? 
Yes, there are people in Colombia that have studied plastic surgery in the United States and gone back to Colombia to offer those services. And people will travel from the U.S. to Colombia to have certain procedures done. Medellin, which is a place I've been to many times and I'm close to, in Spanish is called Silicon Valley. And it's not because of their commitment to R&D around <laughs> microprocessors. So this is what globalization does. We sometimes think that uh, we're, not, we're not touched by this. We are all touched by globalization. That's true. I'm not making this up. That's true. So what do these facts mean? This is the garage where HP was founded. Somewhat of a metaphor for what we're talking about today, but is the garage empty? I don't know. We lost much of our core manufacturing know-how. What became of our nation of tinkerers, the people who worked in, in those garages and started entire industries? I read an article in Business Week not a month ago where welding, which is considered an art, it's a trade, that there are levels of skills in welding. We're short 150,000 welders in the United States for jobs that can pay upwards of over $100,000 a year. There are limited pathways for youngsters to develop these innate mechanical skills. Everything's about getting into college. There just aren't enough pathways for people to pursue other skills, other interests. Can't compete on wages in service or manufacturing. And the gap between required skill sets and actual abilities is increasing. And again, talk to anybody that works in the employment field and they more than likely will concur. Much of the world is caught up. We talked about Poland, we talked about Vietnam, there's a bunch more. Everyone else isn't too far behind. So here's the essence of a free market economy. See if you can tell me who said this. You had the Schumpeter one. This one, you get this one and you're in business. The annual labor of every nation is the fund which originally supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life. Labor meaning the people who do the work that invent, that innovate. The butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers. Who said this? It was written the same year that the United States declared its independence. It's not like we didn't know this from the beginning. Adam Smith. The Wealth of Nations, the Capitalist Handbook, where things like the invisible hand of competition, the division of labor, the sanctity of private property, the importance of contracts were all laid out by Adam Smith. It's not like we didn't know this. this. This is in the first paragraph of a book that's this thick. I read it 25 years ago. It's in the first paragraph. You don't even have to read the whole thing. Right there. The, <laughs> the, I'm giving away all my secrets here. The annual labor, the people who do the work, is what supplies it with all the necessaries and conveniences of life. So now, the age of the knowledge worker. I remember hearing in the 1980s and reading in reputable magazines that the United States, we didn't have to make anything anymore because we had all these countries <laughs> around the world that would do that menial stuff for us. We're a service economy. We are the knowledge worker where we possess certain skills that others don't have. Only the productivity of the knowledge worker can make it possible for developed countries to maintain their high standard of living against the competition of low-wage developing economies. Sounds like something that might have been said fairly recently. Who's that guy? And these guys, they all look alike. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it's a, oh, it's just a spitting image of Milton Friedman. In fact, I think that is Milton Friedman. That's Peter Drucker. And I'll tell the, the younger people here and the adults too, if you're looking for great books to read and you don't want to spend your life reading self-help books and being up at four in the morning watching Tony Robbins, there's one book you need to read. And it's this one, The Effective Executive, written in 1966. So we knew this then, too. So let's see how we've done in terms of the knowledge worker. We're going to have a look at some recent innovations. Now, this isn't to diminish all the great work that's been done over the years, particularly in the 2000s and in, in robotics and continued software development. So this is a little tongue-in-cheek, but the fact remains. Let's look at some of our innovations. When Western civilization finally went off the, the edge, was when we started to brand water. <laughs> Think about this. <clears throat> the branding of water. I was with somebody not too long ago, about a year ago, and I'll, I'll actually have some now to demonstrate. <laughs> that it was, we were in Southern California, out seeing some clients, it was hot out. We decided we're going to get a drink. We go to 7-Eleven. <clears throat> and I went in, I did my thing, and I came standing outside, I'm drinking a, a soda, and this guy comes out, he doesn't have anything. 
I said, well, how come you didn't get anything? They didn't have my brand of water, the guy says. I made them walk home, number one, because I just, I was shocked by that. But it's water, it's HT, HTO. I was at LAX the other day, dying of thirst, and I was looking and I checked. A bottle of Diet Coke, same size bottle, was $2.99. LAX is a ripoff, we all know that anyway. Bottle of water, $3.50. How is that even possible? It doesn't have as much stuff in it. Th this, this is the end of Western civilization right here, just so you know. Some more innovations. The cheese stuffed crust pizza. This is another big one. I'm a pizza fan. I'm not saying you shouldn't enjoy it, but this is, this is our idea of innovation. Here's another one. The Vortex Bear Top. When I, was, when I was a young guy and we were in college and maybe having a bear or two, what did you used to do then? Before the advent of the Vortex Nation. Shotgun, right? Take, your, take a, a bear can. This is, my kids are here. These are my friends told me about this. This isn't anything that I did, okay? You take a bear can, hold it on its side, and put your keychain in there and hold it up, hold it up, and then pop it, and then it comes flying out. This, this is yet another step forward. The vortex, and look at this. This has been trademarked. Wide mouth can. That's original. It's been trade, that's a trademark right there. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's the blue one, right? When it's really cold, it turns blue. How about you just put your hand on it? Then you can tell if it's cold or not. <coughs> Here's another one. <coughs> the, uh, what is this even called? Vapor. Thank you, the vapor. Anything that has a built-in atomizer and a lithium battery, I don't know if I want to put it in my mouth, but I suppose it's better than a cigarette. And then the all-time favorite, and this was in the Time Magazine Top 25 Innovations of 2013, I'm not even kidding, the crow nut. The crow nut. It's a half, I don't even know, croissant and a donut. It was in Time Magazine as a top 25 innovation. That's ridiculous. <coughs> so here we are. Here we go. Creative destruction in the 21st century. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and here's another one. If one more total stranger endorses me on LinkedIn, I'm going to go on a rampage because I don't even know who these people are. YouTube. I can't even remember. Who's this? What is it? Flickr, Flickr. This is Instagram and this is Snapchat, right? So you might argue, okay, fine, these, these are high-end software algorithms, they create a lot of jobs, but I think we have to look at this from a net perspective. So if they create 50,000 jobs for actual writing code and working in these companies, how many people lost their job for screwing around too much <laughs> on Facebook and Twitter in the office? There's a net impact there, okay. So the, the fact remains is, I, I think we've demonstrated that creative destruction, that the, the capitalist model has really worked over the years, but outsourcing of jobs in a justifiable scenario has had its impact. So we need to be thinking about what is it that we can do to, to bring some of the, the luster back to this, to this model. And these are the, the people, along with those butchers and bakers and candlestick makers that do this. But have a look at this montage. What do you notice about this? Say that again? They're all white males. There's only two. This gent here was born in Moscow, two foreign born, born in Moscow, and he was born in South Africa. Now that's not to diminish the contribution of the white male. I obviously have a vested interest in promoting that. But I think if we broaden the pool of talent, and had more people involved in innovation and invention, et cetera, we'd be better off. Or what we like to call, you're gonna need a bigger boat. You heard him, slow ahead. Slow ahead. I can go slow ahead. Come on down and show them some of this slop. obvious metaphor there. We're going to need a bigger boat. I remember when this movie came out, I was 16 years old. It was the most incredible movie 
to watch. But the, the metaphor is, is obvious there because whereas the, the gentlemen and many, many others, and women too, that, that really pushed the economy forward, we need a bigger boat, we need a bigger pool of talent. Because there's not just one shark, there's many, and they're all as big as, as Bruce. You know that that shark, his name was Bruce in the, in the movie? And Steven Spielberg, who did Jaws, here's a little trivia for you, named the shark Bruce because that was his lawyer's name. Did you know that? That's a true story. That's a true story. So here we are at the capitalist paradox. We're, we're, we're running down on time here, but think about this. And I, I remember this as a kid from my father incessantly. This country was built on self-reliance and rugged individualism. All the entrepreneurs that we saw that started business. Thomas Watson Sr. founded IBM at 40. He got fired from his job and started IBM. Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon, if he got an order for a book and he didn't have it, he'd run down to Barnes & Noble, buy it at a loss, and, s and send it to the customer just so he could fill an order. So you can see the, the entrepreneurship. But I can remember hearing this, stand on your own two feet. These are my parents talking now. You have to make your own way in this world. No one's going to give you anything. I learned that one back on the East Coast, on the business end of a jackhammer and a mop and some other not so pleasant things. But this is how, this is what we think, that rugged individualism, that Puritan value of, of the work ethic. It's ingrained in us. Capitalism, build a better mousetrap or out hustle the competition. We all know that. <clears throat> it's best regulated by the market, not the government. At least Adam Smith likes to think so. We'll stick with that for purposes of this conversation. However, and this is where the paradox comes in. The development of an advanced 21st century workforce requires a concerted effort by government, academia, and business. This is the whole crux of making hay. Because capitalism as a standalone, while very, very successful in a globalized environment, all the competition that has caught up to us and is in the process of surpassing us has been doing just this. What can we learn from them? That is the capitalist paradox. <coughs> Some more trivia, the essence of free market economics and that paradox, survival of the fittest. Everybody knows the law of the jungle. We love this stuff. Every Sunday on the NFL, the survival of the fittest. Who said this? Survivor, what? <laughs> that was a little before that. <clears throat> survival of the fittest. Some people think it was Charles Darwin who said this. It was not. It was this guy. And while I love the chops, this isn't Charles Darwin. His name's Herbert Spencer, and he wrote it in 1864. Survival of the fittest, the law of the jungle. A competitive market economy in the age of globalization is about the ability to adapt to change. Charles Darwin, who wrote the book, among others, The Origin of Species, never said the survival of the fittest. How could he when he wrote his book in 1859? It's about the ability to adapt to change. We created the world that we have to adapt to. So let's run some examples by here. We talked about IBM as a big comeback. <coughs> its first business was punch card machines. They transitioned into computers in 1950. Transitioned again into PCs in 1981, but started to get schooled by Compaq and HP and Dell and others. They lost $8 billion in 1993 when Lou Gerstner came in as CEO. They converted to IT solutions and services, staying away from, or getting away from hardware. They sold the PC division to Lenovo, Chinese company, in 2005. They're in the process of selling their <laughs> server division to the very same Lenovo. 2013 sales, second biggest comeback in the history of US business. 2013 sales in 99, call it $100 billion. That's a big example. Let's look at one that's a little more local. A company that I met not too long ago here in Southern California called Weld On Adhesives. Uh, we have the, the management representatives here. Could you raise your hand, please? Janet, Tracy, and Fabio. <coughs> what a great story. Founded in 1954 and privately held by an organization called IPS Corporation. I don't share, understandably, a lot of sales figures or strategies, but they've done quite well for themselves adapting to change. Headquarters in SoCal, operations in multiple states. What do they sell? These products here. Premium plastic pipe cements, primers, and specialty products based on the original formula in 1954. Premium means they charge a premium price for a very high quality product. However, in the last decade, foreign competition posed a threat to that high quality premium price model. Started to make a strategic shift, a commitment 
managerial commitment to export trade, investment in the business, in automation, a long-term vision of the future and not living from quarter to quarter. And as recently as seven years ago, whereas export sales were 20% of total revenues, in that time frame up until now have grown over 50%. Selling high priced, high quality products, working in a state where it's too expensive and the taxes are so high, these guys have kicked butt. So congratulations to you, a round of applause for creating some jobs here. <laughs> great, great story. Th this is what we need to be doing. So, we're running a little bit over here, but we're coming to the big moment, all right? So what if we can't adapt to change? There's a concept that I learned about some years ago in a book called The Fifth Discipline, called The Tragedy of the Commons. And it was actually brought about by a Stanford guy named Garrett Hardin in 1968. And it talks about a shared resource. Think of you if you own a condo or you live in a, a gated community. If you didn't have the condo association, who would take care of the common areas? Who would cut the grass? Well, we're all going to take turns. We're all going to share. We all know how that works out. No one does it. So it's a common resource, exploited by many, taken care of by no one. Brazilian rainforest is an example, and George's Bank. These are the fishing grounds off my state of Massachusetts that were, have been fished out forever and are just starting to come back. So what's the analogy here? The US has exploited capitalism without preparing for globalization. Straight up. We, don't, we run the risk of experiencing not the tragedy of the commons, but the tragedy of the common. Meaning that our $16 billion GDP will be eclipsed maybe in that remaining 30 years of the American century by the Chinese who are at $9 billion a year. Is it the end of the world? Of course not. It will be the end of the world as we know it and we'll continue to see a, a, a continued gap in the middle class and all the things that you hear about on the news. That will continue to happen for sure. The tragedy of the common. Well, I finally did. I learned something from these two men. I learned to give love and get love unconditionally. You just have to accept people for what they are. And I learned the greatest gift of all. The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And the choices that you make will shape your life forever. But you can ask anybody from my neighborhood and they'll just tell you, this is just another Bronx tale. Remember that movie, A Bronx Tale? The, the biggest waste is waste, the biggest Sin in life is wasted talent. I think we as a country, while we've been so, so, so successful, that too much talent is falling through the cracks for a variety of different reasons. Some of which is driven by globalization, some of which just driven by life in and of itself. But we have to find a way to exploit as much talent, and I hate to use the word exploit, to develop as much talent as we possibly can so that process of creative destruction becomes faster and faster and faster. Because the, the minute we innovate, stuff is offshored immediately. Look at the GoPro. That's a pretty cool, I don't know if I'd call it an invention, but it's pretty innovative. But where are all the, where's that stuff all made? I guarantee you, it's made, made overseas. So we have to continue, continue, continue. That accelerated pace of creative destruction has to continue. So, last few slides. What's a country to do? Good question. <clears throat> I can tell you what we shouldn't do. Stop thinking that tax cuts and low interest rates by themselves will stimulate growth. We heard about this all through the, the financial crisis. It's, it's, it's the classic case of leading a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Now, any business person will tell you that low taxes are a great thing. It's, it's the end of April. I think we all know that. <clears throat> and low interest rates are a great thing. But do you really think that the guys in the garage up in Silicon Valley were saying, well, I'm going to wait uh, to patent this because the taxes are too high. Or the guys that wrote the algorithms for Google were saying, we need to wait for, wait for interest rates to come down before we launch that search engine. It becomes very important over time, low taxes and such, but people that innovate are, are usually in it for other reasons, other, at least at the beginning, for money. This is a much more complex equation than two variables. Stay away from protectionism. Let's that, that just want to get that out there. We can't get all those horses back in the barn and close the door. That's a done deal. It's over <clears throat> in terms of liberalized trade. Tax credits for export-oriented activities. This is, exposes itself to gaming the system, but I think we need to do a little bit more of that. I think we demonstrated this pr pretty well. Stop using free trade agreements as a proxy for foreign policy. Let's get some deals done with big countries. Brazil, 200 million people. The Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, 
which is most of Southeast Asia and part of the western side of the Western Hemisphere. All of these countries, especially in Southeast Asia, the Association of Southeast Asia Asian Nations, they already have a free trade agreement with each other. <coughs> what else can we do? Continued government support of basic research. Every single industry that we saw got its start with support from the United States government. Now you might say, oh, the whole Solyndra thing and that solar and what have you. That wasn't basic research. That was a loan. And I'm sorry to say that, that whoever investigated the, in the underwriting process of that loan, a, a sophomore business major could have done a better job in terms of Solyndra and that whole solar thing because they were usurped by cheap Chinese substitutes. It's not really that hard to figure out. So we can't get confused about that. We have to continue this research. The internet, computers, cell phones, the integrated circuit, it was all funded and sponsored in part by the United States. University-based research and development, both basic and applied, and more liberal patent rules. If a professor comes up with a patent working for a university, they should be able to share more in the action. Today, it's not always like that. Canada, as an example, is much more liberal in sharing its patent riches. Renewed commitment to technical and community colleges, a place to tinker, as I like to say. How about European-style apprenticeships? In our logistics business in Southern California, there's a paucity of really, truly knowledgeable people compared, this is a relative statement, compared to their colleagues in Europe because logistics is actually an apprenticeship where you go to university and you work for a couple of years. These people know more than we do. It's just that simple. And it's not just logistics. We need to adopt this. And this whole idea around technical and community colleges and financial aid and such, it's not a handout. But what we like to call, us city boys like to call ten fingers. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Ten fingers is when you came to a fence in the city or a tree in a park and it was too high to get up and you're with your buddy, what do you do? You give them ten fingers like this and they step in and you hoist them up and then what do they do? They pull you up. That's not a handout. It's ten fingers. Remember that. Okay? Last one. Second to last one. Visa policy and procedures. Remember the guy who ran for president and he was Mr. The rent's too damn high? Well, I'm Mr. There's too many white boys in that montage that we saw. Vastly talented, brilliant people, but we need more overseas talent. Different ethnicity, diversity, different ways of thinking. We need to bring more talent to the table. It's just that simple. Infrastructure. All the highways and ports and all the things that Metrans studies. We need to continue to invest in this. I read on Sunday in the newspaper there were 63,000 bridges in the United States in need of repair. I didn't even know there were 63,000 bridges in the whole country. Never mind ones that needed to be fixed. Okay, I promise not to, to go off the rail, but we need to reform public education. Languages from the first grade. You know what I noticed about when I went to, when I was working with Weldon? And just last week when I was in Houston working with an oil and gas company, Lots of young people on the team, and we went around the table just out of cu curiosity and said, how many languages do we have represented in the room here? And at Well Done, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, French, Arabic, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Chinese English, of course, that's kind of a gimme, and there were only six people in the room. <laughs> Amazing. This is what we need to be doing. This whole business, my kids are of the age, they're going to sixth and seventh grade, and being told because they're bilingual to begin with, uh, you can't take Spanish in the sixth grade. And the guidance counselor says, well, why don't, you, why don't you think about ceramics? Or how about drama? Well, you know, we have, we're a multicultural family with three kids. We have enough of our own drama. We don't need to be <laughs> taking it in school. <coughs> Unbelievable. Diverse curriculums based on aptitude and abilities. This whole thing, and I experienced this in high school, and I was so lucky because my mother worked in the school department as a secretary. And I wasn't very good at math, I wasn't very good at biology. And into the 11th grade, you had to take chemistry and physics, and this was not the path that Dan was going to be going down. And my mother called up a couple of her friends. You know what, she, what class she got me in? Because she had a little pull? Typing. And to this day, typing has saved my behind writing books and articles and just doing work. I, I, passed the, I took the civil service exam. I can type 72 words a minute on a manual typewriter. Do you even know what that is? Does anyone even know what a manual <laughs> typewriter is? Okay, you need a diverse curriculum because this meat grinder that we put these kids in, in the 10th grade to college, it's just counterproductive. 
I've seen it up front. Abolish teacher tenure in public grade schools. Not universities, for obvious reasons. <laughs> but in, <laughs> and, <laughs> and public, and public grade schools. <clears throat> I had some of the best, I went to public schools when I was a kid, had some of the best teachers, pe teachers that really changed my life. But I was also had teachers that had no business at all being in front, of a, in front of a room full of kids. And teacher tenure in public schools is nothing more than protecting teachers that don't belong there. I'm sorry, it's the truth. Happens to this day. We should put them on merit pay. Higher salaries in exchange for a recertification requirement. Every three years you have to upgrade your skills. And pay them a bonus. You know, we, you talk about the common core, state, this, and what have you. It's about measuring students. We need to measure the teachers. Because anybody knows, and I read this in that book by Peter Drucker, that whether you're in a classroom or an organization, people are going to rise to the level of competence of the leadership. And when the teacher's the leader in the room, and they're not qualified, it's going to dumb down the classroom. Period. Teacher unions should, shouldn't be allowed to do that. All right. And most of all, I've been ranting for a while here, but I got a little worked up. I hope you enjoyed the show. <clears throat> we need a strategy as a country to come together like China did, like Korea did, the rest of the Asian tigers, and a concerted effort between academia, business, government, and not just state, oh, we have the National Export Initiative. Does anyone even talk about that anymore? You don't even hear about it anymore. I'm talking about a legitimate strategy here to move forward. And most of all, and this is for the young people, find a way to differentiate yourself in the marketplace and have the skills that you're going to need to be gainfully employed in the workplace, whether it's through languages or acquiring other skills or just doing something better and working harder out hustling somebody else because you have to make hay while the sun is shining. Thank you very much. And let's talk for a second about free trade agreements. They have to be negotiated. And the agreement with Colombia and Korea was over a period of years. And there are different aspects, whether it's medical equipment or agricultural exports. Every facet of that agreement has to be negotiated. And tariffs and non-tariff barriers to trade are going to be diminished and wiped out over, typically over a period of 10 years. So you get what you negotiate. That's point number one. And the point about the companies, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I think where companies choose to operate what will influence how well they do. But the, the company that I was with last week in, in Houston, for example, oil and gas selling valves and fittings and, and steel pipe and what have you, have a very sophisticated operation in Houston, but they source out of partially, not completely, partially out of China, ship direct from China to customers the state-owned oil companies in Colombia, which is Ecopetrol, Perevesa, and Venezuela. So you're right about companies, they, they're making strategic decisions that originally were heavily influenced by the countries and what they had negotiated and earned some years before. You put the item up there in regard to, you know, quit thinking that uh, just cutting taxes is going to uh, address the issue. And I agree that that is one aspect of it, but it's a pretty important and if, you're going, and if you're in manufacturing, you really have to look from a governmental standpoint about the burden that you're putting on manufacturers or anyone else who is trying to start a business. Because the amount of uh, controls that have been placed on businesses today is growing a lot and it's getting worse and it's much more difficult to have a company in, in this country and, and in this state than it has been in the past. So, it, it, uh, so it's both a tax issue and where it's, you know, the U.S. is very, very uncompetitive on taxes today relative to other countries around the world. And people here don't really recognize it. Um, so that's one issue. But then the other part is the regulation. And, I, and I'm, I'm not anti-government. I, I mean, you've got to have a certain level of regulation. But, uh, but it, it gets to the point of where it really becomes a big hobble. And, and that is part of the strategic, uh, the strategy that I think ought to be looked at. I went to a presentation made by uh, a couple of governors of other states who were trying to attract businesses out of California, and they were talking about how they're focused on their state government and going through all the regulations that they have about business and getting rid of whatever is out there that is hobbling and not providing that benefit to society. And you just don't hear that often enough in, at both the national level and the state level. I worked my butt off when I was young, and I did all those things, and I worked 16 hours or 18 hours a day. 
But today, there's all these restrictions that are placed on people or businesses where you can't let your employees do that. So they really can't out hustle the competition mm. within those eight hours. So what do, you, what do you think? What do you think about that? Uh, it's all true, and, and I see it in, in my own daily business activities in terms of having to pay overtime after eight hours, whether someone worked through 40 hours in the week or things of that nature. Uh, it, it comes down to the willingness, I think, of the individual to do those things and, and not, not make themselves a liability, either as, a, as a, their own productivity or from a legal perspective. But the, the, there were just certain things in the United States that we can't compete at. And I think wearing apparel, footwear, labor, labor intensive, um, not as high a level of skills, it's just, it's over. As, as far as that goes. So we have to recognize that and prepare people better for these jobs that innovation and some extra hustle really do make the difference. And I think Weldon is a very good example of that.